Not imposed? Did you really say not imposed? What if you reject this offer? What are you told by what have you been told for centuries by Christians? If you reject this offer that took place by means of a torture to death of a human being that you didn't want and should have prevented if you could. What if you reject the offer? If you, if you accept it, you can have eternal life and your sins are forgiven. Oh, great. What a horrible way to abolish your own responsibility and get your own bliss. I don't want it. Oh, you don't? Well, then you can go to hell. This is not imposed. This hasn't been preached to children by, by gruesome elderly virgins with back by force for centuries. <laughs> hasn't po hasn't, this hasn't poisoned whole societies? No. Imp of course it's, it's not voluntary. The, uh, uh, the Pope of Rome, as I call the Bishop of Rome, Mr. Ratzinger, Herr Ratzinger, has recently said, actually, it's worse than that. Only my version of Christianity can get you salvation. And there is only one way. I say it in Georgetown. There's only one. You presumably don't believe that because you're an Anglican. But on what basis do you tell the Pope that he's a heretic? Once you grant this stuff, once you start with this white noise chat about redemption, where is it going to end? Of course there's nothing voluntary about it. And <laughs> I must say the book of Revelation seems one of the less... Uh, voluntary texts of the. It, all it does is look forward gleefully to apocalypse, um, and to, the, to the passing away of this veil of uh, tears and to our ultimate destruction. This is morality. I don't think so. Well, I think if I could just build on that because I think, I think a very interesting line of discussion has opened up here. Um, number one, um, I, I, I think um, I. <laughs> I do challenge your reading of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is very much saying to Christians who are being persecuted for their faith by a secular authority, who are in effect being, being uh, victimized, that this is not the way it's going to remain, that one day there will be an inversion of the world order. It's in effect an encouragement to those who are suffering. And again, I make my point again that Christianity is saying, look, here is an offer. It is yours to accept or not. Uh, I, I take it you do not believe in hell or anything like that. And therefore, I, I don't see what the difficulty is for you personally. It is not about imposition. <laughs> But you're in the right church, but the wrong pew. I mean, I've, yes, I've, of course I've emancipated myself from all that nonsense. I, I wish you would do too. I'm saying, what is the belief? And when you say it's voluntary, it's up to you. It's entirely optional. I don't think it's any more optional than Abraham saying to his son, do you want to come for a long and gloomy walk? <laughs> because God seems to be telling me to do something that had better be moral. Otherwise, it would have to be said that God had taken a perfectly normal person and asked him to commit an atrocity. Now, where else could that have come from? And millions of people every year celebrate this act of sadomasochism as if it proved that God loved us so much that he'd make us kill our own children. And then he decides to love us so much he'll kill one of his own. You said in a debate with Richard Dawkins, I, I have it down, you said the great thing about God is he knows what it's like to lose a son. Now, I want, to want the, you ladies and gentlemen to ponder that expression for us now. First, it's self-evidently, if the story is the true, which I don't think it is, it's self-evidently not the case, even in the narrative. He doesn't lose a son. He lends one. He doesn't offer one because no one's demanded it. There's no problem that has so far been identified in the human species that demands a human sacrifice. For what problem, for what ill is this a cure? There's no argument, there's no evidence. There. No, it's imposed. Upon you. I'm doing this because the prophets said I would. And I'm, I'm going to have the boy tortured to death in public to fulfill ancient screeds of, of Bronze Age Judaism. But, but wait, I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't feel better for it. I feel very uneasy about it. Well, that's a pity, because then you're going to be cast into eternal fire. <laughs> this is no way to talk. I don't like to be addressed in that tone of voice. So. <laughs> I have me, to, let to let all me. this, I have to return a slight non serviam, if I may be so bold, and take my chances morally. That that's the more ethical thing to do. I have a don't want torture, don't want human sacrifice, don't want authoritarian bloodlettings, smoking temples and altars. 
incantations of priests and uh, around all that. They don't want it. Can't think of a single thing it will make better about our let me see a professor our McGrath veil of tears. Time. Oh yes, by all means. Yes. Thanks. Sorry if I bang on a bit about this. No, well, uh, uh, don't worry. I'll interrupt. Go ahead. I don't want those things either, uh, and I think that uh, nobody here really would. I think that uh, one can interpret these things in these ways. You, you do, and I, I appreciate that. But I want to make the point there are many other ways of looking at these within the Christian tradition, and that it's very important to say that um, you know, there are other ways of making sense of this, and I think we need to get some of them on the table. For me, uh, and again, I, I'd want to emphasize this point, uh, the Christian vision of God is not a God who leaves us on our own, but a God who chooses to enter into time and history where we are in order to make possible for us, if we want it, a transformation of our situation. After 98,000 years. I don't see any... Of abstention. I don't see any need to say this needs to torture or anything like that. If it does, that needs to be challenged. But the point for me is, this is about something being offered to us with enormous potential for change. Let me ask a question of Mr. Hitchens. As someone who considers himself a high primate, <laughs> it seems strange that you would consider loving and witnessing the truth an obligation. Would you explain how a soulless primate can have any obligations? Well, it's a, it's a, a question one often asks oneself. Uh, for example, why do I care? You know? um, why do I mind about other primates? I think I know that because I hope that they will, at the very lowest, I would say, because I hope they'll mind about me in return. I mean, I'll give you an example. Why should they? Well, why indeed? Um, why does one do the right thing, or one hopes is the right thing, when no one's looking? Why does a Muslim cab driver go to all the trouble to come back to my apartment building when I didn't have his number to return a large sum of money I left on his back seat, said it was his religious duty? But if I allow him to say that that's his religious duty, what am I going to say when he says it's his religious duty to veil his wife? or to blow himself up, um, or to impose Sharia law. If you grant it once, you have to grant the whole thing. You can't do it a la carte. Now, I'll give you an example from my old socialist days. This will bring the t uh, moisture to the eyes of Dr. McGrath as well. Um, it was our favorite example, uh, Professor Peter Townsend's book on the gift relationship, you remember? Why does the British National Health Service never run out of blood, though you're not allowed to charge for it? You have to give it free. Never runs out of blood. Because people like to give blood. They want to feel useful. I like to do it. I like it very much. Um, and I'm not a masochist, and I don't particularly like being stuck. But I lose, I like the way that I lose, uh, someone gains a pint and I don't lose one, because I replenish it quite quickly. Someone's instantly better off. I haven't had to abnegate myself by giving anything away. Um, I like the fact that I'm helping someone who I don't know. And as it happens, I have a very rare blood group, indeed. And one day I'm going to have to count on other people feeling the same way. So human solidarity will get you quite a long way ethically. And there's every reason why that should be in our genes, in our, in our, in our so to speak, inscribed. We wouldn't have got this far if we didn't have these qualities. To say we couldn't have them without celestial permission seems to me to be simply slavish. And if we're all made in God's image, then how come there are so many sociopaths who don't notice the existence of other people, or so many psychopaths for whom it's a positive pleasure to inflict pain? Uh, none of these, all of these are easily, easily solved questions if you make the assumption of evolution by natural selection and consider us as an animal species. If you detect the finger of God in all this, you invent myriad problems that do not exist and cannot be solved and that are actually a waste of our mentality.